but it will help if you have Genesis 9, uh, 1 to 17 open as we uh, just look through these verses of God's word uh, together this evening. Uh, it's probably not, not going to take much imagining, but uh, imagine waking up in a world where seemingly overnight everything around you has very dramatically changed. And it's nothing like you've ever seen or known uh, before. Well, it doesn't take too much to imagine, does that? Because we've had uh, the experience of the past two years where seemingly at times, very frequently, the world that we thought we knew was changed to beyond recognition. But what exactly was it like uh, for Noah walking out of the ark into a whole new world? Everything refreshed, everything having been washed and renewed, having known everything that God was doing whilst Noah was on board the ark, as he was bringing judgment on the world. It's a bit of a strange thought, isn't it? And to wake up one morning to be able to walk outside and find that of all the people on the earth that were there, all of a sudden there is only eight of you. And the entire world is open to you, and God has told you to get on with the purpose of just living for him. And you can imagine him going, well, where do I begin? What do I do? Well, Noah wasn't without help. God, we see as we thought about a little bit this morning at least, uh, gives Noah some directives. And we have God giving here Noah again some directives, some understanding as to what is to take place. Remember, this is taking place where? On a mountain. It is on Mount Ararat in modern Turkey uh, today. At least that's where we believe it, it probably was. Uh, and he's there on this mountain and, and, and he's being met by God in a special way to say to Noah, this is how you're now going to carry on. Actually, it has, doesn't it, striking significance for us still today because everything that we see spoken here by God to Noah still impacts us. God here makes promises that are binding not just for Noah but for all of creation for the entirety of his existence. In fact, it is God is bound, binds himself for the entirety of his existence, which is eternity, to certain actions here on this earth. So I want to ask you, uh, do you get excited when you catch glimpses of God working? Because actually this passage gives us, the, gives us little lenses to help us see God working in miraculous and wonderful and marvellous ways still today. Because 4,000 years later, what do we still see? These promises are being kept. And if that doesn't thrill us, well, I think we've probably missed something about the working, the nature, the character, and our relationship uh, with God. And what we see, as we're going to see just briefly this evening, is the state of the world and the commitment of God to it. Uh, and we have, uh, under the heading of God, uh, this is the God who promises, one he first heading, God clarifies something first. Uh, when we... Uh, moved into our house, uh, the kitchen was going to be in dramatic need of redoing. Uh, there wasn't much in the kitchen, there was a tiny little bit of worktop, there wasn't even space for a cooker. Ian came out with his saw and sorted that out in our worktop, you know, and it, was, it needed some work. Well, I had one condition for our kitchen. It's got to have a dishwasher. <laughs> Don't care how big, it's got to have a dishwasher. Now dishwashers are brilliant, right? You put stuff in, and in theory, it comes out clean. Although it does, although every so often, uh, you put something in and it comes out the dishwasher and you look at it and go, it's gonna be round two. <laughs> or even there are times where you open up the dishwasher and you realize, oops, 
got to put one of those cleansing capsules in. And well, it's all had a jolly good rinse and some of it looks like it might be passable, but let's be safe, let's run it through the cycle. Again, usually washing results in something getting cleaner, at least that's the intent, isn't it? <laughs> I guess it, do, it does depend as to what you wash something in or with, doesn't it? Um, but there has been, here at the start of chapter nine, there's been a global flood. You know, the entire world has been submerged underwater. It has been entirely, incredibly washed. You know, it's, it's the most it's sort of extensive dishwasher you could ever possibly find as the fountains of the deep erupted, as the, the heavens dumped water down out of the sky. This is, uh, we, we, there is nothing about the, the flood that should, we should think of as being a, you know, a little gentle trickle. It is a violent upheaval on the face of the earth. Everything's supposed to be clean. And yet, cast your eyes back into chapter 8 and verse 21. This is what God says as he clarifies his understanding and position on the world. We're told that the Lord, he smells this sacrifice that Noah uh, offers to him and it's pleasing to him. But God says this, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every thought or even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. You go, Lord, what was the point of sending the flood? If, if the purpose of the flood was to deal with sin, well, it's been a problem. Because it hasn't dealt with it. Lord, you, you, you've said that there is a problem in the heart of every single human being. We know that, don't we? And it was never God's intention in the flood to re bring a remedy to all the problems that had already been created by sin. The flood was an act of judgment, and it was to a degree an act of cleansing, but it was never ever going to be the final thing, was it? We would love it to have been that you know, after... Adam and Eve in the garden, we, we see Eve, don't we, even when she looks at her sons and she, she has Cain, and he, his name literally means, you know, this is the man. He's not. He's an absolute disaster. Now there's this hope from early on after the fall that God was going to deal and sort, with it, sort everything out, and he doesn't. Not in the way that people longed for. And God knows this. And he says, this is the state of the earth. And yet, God immediately makes a, a binding promise, doesn't he? He says there in verse 21 of chapter 8, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans. He says, I, I, I know this is going to be the condition. And I know that over the many years and over the hundreds, over the thousands of years, that the earth is going to continue on for existing. Who knows? It might even be millions of years. He says, this is going to be the state. And yet I'm going to continue to choose to show mercy, grace, patience, favour, consideration, care, towards those on the earth. We even have it with Noah, don't we? Noah's heart is still sinful. We get into chapter 9. We didn't read it, but from chapter 9, verse 18, uh, we see Noah falling into sin. He gets drunk and he lays about you know, naked in his tent and it gets all really awkward. And one of his sons you know, goes and gossips about it and does nothing and points fun at him and you go, oh, you know, come on, Noah. You know, you're a righteous man and you're, you're known by God and you're under God's grace. And yet it doesn't sort it out, does it? That doesn't mean or ensure perfection. And in many ways, this describes so uncomfortably, but helpfully clearly, you know, the experience of us as believers, doesn't it? Though we go through uh, that washing of water, we go through baptism. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 3, talks about the flood as being a picture of baptism. You know, though we go through, through waters and we have this symbolic uh, symbol of, of washing and the purifying before God, it doesn't mean that we're free from 
evil influences. That we're entirely loosed from the bonds and the impacts of living here on this earth. And we, it's what we want, isn't it? It's, it's our goal, it's our desire as Christians to, to live holy and righteous lives. But it's always going to be a battle. And God acknowledges that here in this passage by saying, look, I, I, the inclination is evil. And even when we become Christians and we're given new hearts and our hearts are, are being rewired, aren't they, into the, 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 the likeness and the desires and the passions of the Lord Jesus Christ, yet Paul says there's something of the, the old self that still remains there because we are still bound here, living in human bodies, still impacted by the effects of the, of the fall. Just turn with me their familiar words to us in, in Romans chapter 7. Paul, off, Paul speaks here, but really clearly, uh, about the battle that goes on within us. Romans chapter 7. Uh, and then you want to find verse 21. Romans 7 verse 21, Paul says this, So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Through my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of mine, of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law to sin at work within me. What a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, Paul there tells us the very thing that's needed, isn't it? It's not just a ceremonial washing on the outside, something that later on the Pharisees forget. And they're concerned about the cleanliness of the pot and the cleanliness of the hands. It's not the cleanliness of the world, is it? It's the cleanliness that's needed of the heart. There's something far deeper needed. It's not a surface washing. It's a heart washing. It's a change before God internally that is required in order for there to be a long-standing relationship that can be enjoyed with God. And there is a soap, isn't there, that's the most powerful detergent ever. It's the work of the Lord Jesus. It's the, his blood being poured out for us. God says the problem is going to, of sin is going to remain. I'm going to stay patient with it. And it leaves us at the and it leaves us and I expect it left Noah saying, Lord, when are you going to deal with it? How are you going to deal with it? And the flood and the ark, they are a picture, aren't they, of that greater pic of that greater work of the Lord Jesus to come. And then secondly, we have God commands. God commands. Now, there is a danger. Uh, when you hear the same things over and over again, uh, you, you switch off. It starts to become a little bit boring to us. It's just a background droning noise. Uh, it's why I think probably at the moment I, I find it very easy to fall asleep to an audio, listening to an audio book. Why? Because I never ever listen past the first five minutes and I put it back and I fall asleep and the next night I think, well I can't remember what it was, let me start again and I fall asleep. Right, same few words. Really boring. I'll get to the end of the book eventually. But, but there are some words that are used here in Genesis 9. We look at it and go, oh yeah, that's really familiar. It's not surprising. God says the same thing. Again, we pointed this, some of this out this morning as well. That there's, a, there's a real familiarity. But yet actually there is a subtle difference in a couple of places that is worth us pointing out about what God says. Because God now starts to use bring a law and the same commands that we find in Genesis chapter 1, but he makes some subtle tweaks to it. Not that those laws were imperfect, but what God is doing is he's adjusting them to cater for a world that is full of sin. He doesn't change the tone, but he says, look, this is the reality of, of the experience that you're going to find. And essentially God says three things uh, to Noah that he should be doing. He says you're going to, you need to be fruitful, have dominion, and enforce 
justice. And so we think about, to begin with, uh, God calling Noah to be fruitful. We see it particularly there in chapter 9, uh, verse 7, uh, where God says, As for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. It's something that we read uh, this morning as well in chapter 8, verse uh, 17 takes us back, doesn't it, to Genesis chapter 1. God said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, have children. This is a recommissioning of the human race to produce offspring. You go, well, why did God need to do it? And what's the purpose of that? You know, has any, does he really need to say that? Has anything even changed? Well, yeah, something really dramatic has changed, hasn't it? Just flick back a few pages to Genesis chapter 3. Right, we know Genesis chapter 3 well, but something fundamental has already happened within that process of being fruitful and multiplying that has brought a cost. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. God says this to the woman. I will make your, your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labour, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. The, the impact of the fall, the impact of sin, has already brought about an additional challenge in humanity fulfilling this command. And it's not just that God has made childbirth painful for the woman, but that there is the pain of in, in having children as well, that sometimes there is... Now, this, the disappointment of children not being present. Or there being challenges for children to arrive. There's already been an impact of the curse. And so in some ways, as God says here, this is what you're supposed to do. I, 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 this is actually, a, or at least it should be in some degree, a comforting thing to Noah and to all people. This is still God's expectation, though it's going to be hard and though there are going to be challenges. You know, we're thankful, aren't we, that you know, whoever, however many numbers of generations have gone up past over the years, that this was something that God still said was going to happen. Something that was still supposed to take place. But it's also worth reminding us, those of us who are parents, children are a blessing. At times, perhaps, where they don't always... Feel it as you're gritting your teeth, as you struggle to work out how to parent them, as they cause you grief or heartache in year, later years, perhaps. But children are a blessing. They are something that God has said are, are good and are to be enjoyed. And yet it's a strange thing, isn't it? Because as we look at the world around about us, that is not always the tone that is said. People say that children get in the way of a career. They're viewed as being a bit of a nuisance. Don't have anything really to do with them until they're an you know, older teenager and able to understand and you can reason with them maybe a little bit better. There's even been the line thrown out in recent years, I'm not having children for the environment. Yeah, okay. You know, it's a new way to term selfishness, I guess, isn't it? But it's, not, it's, it's, good to, it's good to have children. And it's supposed to, as we know, be in those confines of marriage. One man and one woman. But it's not just about the family, though, is it? It's obvious, by the way, that God says you're supposed to multiply on the earth. That is obviously going to be talking about children. But he also says it there in verse 7. Be fruitful in the things that you do. Be fruitful. Well, fruitfulness doesn't just mean... Now, having children, but it can also mean have a growth, have increase, to show development. Uh, uh, what is God calling Noah to here to do? He's calling Noah to positively use his intellect and his skills, his qualities and, uh, and all the, uh, the brains that he has to further and, and help sustain and provide and increase life. And that, have to, that happens through social care, through the development of jobs, through the technologies that uh, are used to help sustain and provide life, through the care of those round about us. We shouldn't look at restricting this verse and say, well, you know, if, if I'm someone that doesn't have children, I'm failing within this promise, within this command of God. 
No. You can be fruitful if you aren't married. As you use what God has given to you for the care and the protection and the looking after life on this earth to extend and increase uh, the people that are here and around us. But secondly, God says something else, uh, particularly to them. He talks about and calls them to have and demonstrate dominion. Uh, chapter, verse 2. Uh, God says there that the fear and the dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the sky and every creature that moves on the earth. Uh, they are given into your hands. You go, well, they, these are familiar words to us. It's all right, you know, we have control over all creation. Well, actually, there's a little bit of a difference again. In Genesis... Now, Adam is called to use his wisdom and his skill and, his, uh, and, and his, his winsomeness, if you can use that sort of phrase in this context, you know, to care for the animals. Uh, yet what we find here in verse 2 is fear and dread are brought in. There is no fear of man to begin with. And what do we find in Genesis chapter 2? All the animals come to Adam. Now, Adam was a vegetarian to begin with, at least as we understand. Now, there was a, a, a freedom and a delight and, you know, the purpose and, and the picture of Eden, of, certainly in Eden, is that everything goes and runs well. That there is no death or grief or upset or anger. God says, look, this is what sin has caused to be caused. There is a fracture, a fissure between humanity and the rest of creation. That superiority that, the pin that man is as the pinnacle of creation is going to result in issues. But it goes further, doesn't it? Because whereas God said to Adam, all the plants are food for you, he now says all the animals are food for you too. At that point we go, well, why? God didn't, doesn't do anything needlessly. It's just, you know, he, he knew that eventually, you know, we had turned to becoming meat lovers and uh, he thought he'd sanction it early. Well, actually, no. This is actually part of God's provision for us. I read a, a news article a couple of years ago now, uh, but it was saying that there's been a growing number of people that are se severely lacking in a vitamin known as B12. Well, what's one of the greatest sources of vitamin B12? Mint, apparently. That or a major injection from a, from a doctor, uh, if you need that. But there are things that actually we need that help sustain us. And, and, and obviously, you know, Adam and Eve, they were never going to need that because they had perfect bodies. They were never going to, and the intention was that, that they would never degrade. But what do we see is we get further away from creation. More problems. We're less of perfect beings, no matter how perfect we might think we are, but we're, we're lesser beings than Adam and Eve ever were. We, we, and God, in his goodness, knew and understood the weaknesses, the changes that would happen to our bodies as the, the greater toll of sin would, would impact us over the years and the generations and the way it would impact on our, on our genetics. And he's giving an accountability for that. A provision of care. But the biggest shift we come to see here in this passage is that God starts to install a new law, or one that hadn't previously at least been stated, because it didn't need to be. And the biggest shift is that God now says there is going to be the need of justice administered within this land. When We, we read there, don't we, in verse 5, God says, I will demand an accounting for your lifeblood. In fact, uh, he says there in verse 6, whoever sheds human blood by a human shall their blood be shed from the image of God has God made mankind. God says, look, there is now a problem. We know about the first murder that took place between Cain and Abel. There is going to be this issue of a lack of justice in this land. And it is because of the sin that has crept in. And now, as people on this earth, you are going to be charged with the responsibility of discharging justice. 
making sure that right and wrong are understood, uh, uh, giving rebuke, even punishment to those that go against what God, ha what God has commanded. This is God introducing a law to deal with the direct effects of sin. See, it's funny, isn't it? We, we all do have a, a sense of justice. We all, everybody wants justice, don't they? Everybody wants to have wrongs righted and for, for, for various things to be proven true and for those who, who are guilty to be held accountable. The trouble is, actually, how often do we really want to actually be the, either the ones that carry it out or how often are, the we, are we the ones that actually are happy to have justice meted out on us? We, we would count that often, uh, perhaps even as an injustice. And here again comes the problem. Though God says you are to carry out justice, what do we find our world doing? Ignoring it. Taking justice and turning it often on its head. It's what we see very painfully, isn't it, in our certainly... In, in Parliament every so often. And in one moment they'll be talking about the rights of women. And then the next moment they'll be talking about the right to kill the weakest and the most vulnerable of women whilst they're still developing in the womb. It's got to be one of the most tragic and painful sins that our world at present is committing past two years there have been more abortions than there have been deaths from COVID and yet nobody bats an eyelid or at least not many do, do, do either because as there is an accountability for this this is something that is going to be serious we need to treat and to value and to be concerned about human life and it isn't just in the case is it as we know later on from Jesus's sermon on the mount when he talks about anger in the heart it's not just about physical shedding of blood are we concerned for justice of people as a whole do we value the lives of others so that when there is a miscarriage of justice and people are, uh, are abused, when they are oppressed, when there are people who are discarded and considered uh, past all kinds of help, are, are we people who still speak up and say they are made in the image of God and their lives are of value? Well, we do, don't we? I know a number of you have written to different MPs and members of the House of Lords at times, and it's right. We say, Lord, we, we, we speak up and say, where is the justice? As we read through these three things that God sets out, there is a degree, isn't there, in which we, kind of, in which we end up saying, as we've been singing on that hymn, how long, O oh Lord? How, how long will you allow these basic, fundamental things that you have commanded people to do from the very beginning, how long will you allow us to ignore it, to break them, to trample over your commands and to ignore your patterns and your ways. It's therefore our duty, isn't it, and responsibility, our privilege as believers to stand up and to say, this is what God has said is good. Let's understand it and see it and live it out so that when people at least see us, in the way that we conduct ourselves, it speaks that we are pleased and to carry out these very simple things. But yet they, it brings honour to the Lord. And then finally, we have God covenants or God commits. Uh, here's a very familiar statement, isn't it? Uh, this week I am going to... Fill in the blank. Uh, we all say it. And really, when we do say it, we, we do say it with a tinge of hopefulness. At least, I trust that that's the case, uh, and that we're not asserting this will definitely happen. Because uh, if we do, James has something to say about it, in which case you need to say this, James 4.15, he says, if the Lord wills. Right? That's the intention, isn't it, behind everything. If, if the Lord wills. Because we don't always get to do what we say. 
we intend to carry out doesn't always come to fruition because uh, what we need in order to be able to carry everything out is to be able to control everything and make sure that it all runs as we intend. We can't do that though. But God can. In fact, what we find here from verse 11 is God creating a... Oh, sorry, from verse 9. God creating a promise that we look at today and say, God has still been faithful. God has still persevered. God says in verse 9, I will now establish my covenant with you, and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that was with you. Note how much God binds himself here. He doesn't just say this is for the people. He says this is for all of creation. I am tying myself to everything that this world has. I'm making a promise to all of you who live on this earth. That there is something I am never going to do again. What is that? Verse 11. We know this. I will never again, uh, will all, never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again. Will there be a flood to destroy the earth? What we need to note here, though, is that this is an incredibly one-sided covenant. God doesn't say to Noah, look, uh, you are at the moment uh, humanity's figurehead. And I'm going to promise never to bring a judgment of flood against you again. And Noah, what I want you to do is to promise that you, on behalf of humanity, will never turn against me again. Or that you will never do this again. He doesn't, does he? Why? Because God, as we've already pointed out, he knows the condition of people's hearts. He doesn't add additional burdens. Instead, this is an entire promise built on the very character and nature of God. And it is entirely dependent on his mercy and his grace. There are no conditions on this. This is a, an absolute freebie that God says he will give to the earth. Why did God promise that he would never flood the world again? Well, the answer has to be very simple, really, isn't it? God was going to demonstrate a long-suffering. He's going to demonstrate and give time for men and women to turn to him for his plan of salvation to be worked out for the fullness of it to be able to be brought and in doing so what do we find well we can never accuse God of being heavy-handed we can never accuse God of being quick to rush into judgment or condemnation in fact if anything here we are you know 4,000 years plus later and God still hasn't broken his promise I mean, what's the longest promise you've kept? I guess it might be your, your wedding vows, or maybe a promise to a childhood friend. But if you knew you were going to have to make a promise and it was going to have to, and it's going to last, you know, four thousand plus years, would you make it? Knowing that the party that you're binding yourself to is going to be, in every possible way showing rebellion, hatred, opposition, rejection, abuse and denial of even at times your very existence for the entirety of that promise. We should end up looking, stepping back and saying how graciously faithful is our God? That as we start, say, sit here this evening, we can say God has still done this and what does God do to make a sign to, to show us that this is serious well we know the sign he puts a rainbow in the sky not a sign of pride or the NHS although that is rather lovely but it is a sign of God's promise a sign that God will never ever change his mind or view or, or, his, or his feelings or attitudes towards the world. In fact, uh, the language that's used here in the, for, for rainbow 
is that of a bow of a warrior hanging hanging up his bow this is you know god saying in many senses look my bow is being hung up my my desire for justice is going to be hung up for you to see in the sky why because it is going to be a sign for you of justice and mercy meeting together you deserve my justice you deserve my judgment but instead i'm going to hang it up in the sky and every time you see it every time i see it it's going to be a sign that my heart is bound to give you as creation my favour And doesn't that picture to us very wonderfully the work of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because it is, isn't it, in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, he says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is through Jesus' death on the cross that God's judgment and mercy meet. And they come to us. And we see this sign again from God above the earth, because Jesus, as Jesus said, when I am lifted up, Jesus is lifted up as a sign above the earth of God's justice and mercy being met and his grace and favour instead being poured out. We mustn't forget, and we can't leave it there, can we? God has promised in this passage to never flood the world again. But we do know that God will judge the world again. It's not a case that God will look at the world and say, well, there's sin there, but I'm just going to ignore it. No. Peter reminds us in 2 Peter chapter 3, he says there's going to be a judgment of fire that comes. The judgment that God will bring to this earth to cleanse it, to to remove sin once and for all, at the end of time. God is going to keep his promise. And we're always going to see that. He's still going to deal with sin ultimately and finally and forever. But as we are here this evening, when you look at this passage, what do we see? We should see great cause for thankfulness. God has bound himself to the care of this world to make sure it endures so that all of his plans and purposes can be worked out so that people like you and I could come to know his salvation and we should, be, we should stand in awe at the faithfulness of God and his gentleness towards us so that his glory uh, might be seen. Let's stand and sing uh, our final hymn for at least this part of the service. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father.